Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Young at Harp. I am Deborah Henson Conant, and this is Kathleen Wiley, and we are here to talk about music and young. So, hi, Kathleen. We are going through the strings of passion, which are the seven strings that create creative resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they're part of a project that I have been working on for many years. And last week we talked about impulse, mm -hmm. which is the first string that takes you from creative impulse all the way to creative expression. And today we are going to talk about structure. And I love talking about structure. And I have always thought, well, probably not always, but certainly as an adult, I got came to the um, realization that for me, structure is freedom or at least structure supports freedom and not externally imposed structure but an internal flexible structure yes and i and i would love to talk about that and one of my big revelations about structure was observing that all mammals have an internal flexible structure, which is bones or a skeleton. It's all set up basically the same way, and yet there is so much freedom in how we are expressed physically and then how we self-express as, you know, whatever we are. And so I'm just curious if that, you know, how, how, that's how I look at structure just as a human being. But in music, I noticed that as a jazz player and also as a composer, that structure gives me the freedom to really just be able to go on flights of fancy and also to play with other people spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my, in a nutshell, structure. How about you? Okay. <laughs> well, I love it because... Um what you said about we have a physical structure of the skeleton, Jung said we have a structure of psyche that I often say to people, we have a psychic structure that's akin to the skeleton. All of our skeletons are alike, but they're also all very different and they get fleshed out in different ways. So the same is true of our psyche souls, that there are basic structures within our psyche, the, uncon the collective unconscious, the personal unconscious, our own conscious self with ego persona, but it gets fleshed out in different ways. And so if we understand the skeleton basics, just like if we know the skeleton of our own body, then we can begin to work to intervene where there are problems or to make changes. Um, so there is a structure psychically in each of us. And when we understand that structure, then we can begin to see how it's fleshed out in us individually. Okay, I got to stop you because you, I hear, okay. keep hearing you say fleshed out, and I'm like, but wait, the psyche <laughs> and the flesh are separate. But are, they are not. Okay, tell me. Well, Jung says if we really knew the body and the mind are different densities of the same energy. Remember, last week we talked about the instinct and the archetype being the different ends of the light spectrum. You know, it's the same energy, it's just a different density. Thus, it manifests differently. It either manifests in a denser substance of matter, body, right. or it manifests in something that's lighter and faster and doesn't come into physical form. Okay, so this clarifies uh, um, this whole idea of creative resonance. I mean, there's these seven <laughs> strings, but the whole point of the seven strings or that I realized as I started exploring them, I mean, the seven strings are just, it, they represent that like an instrument, like the harp has seven strings in each octave. They get repeated, um, but they resonate to each other and then they resonate the whole body. And then what I noticed is that as you play an instrument, your body starts to resonate and then, or my psyche or whatever, internally I realized it was almost as though the longer I played the instrument, the more clear an instrument happened inside of me, almost as though my body was the mirror surface mm -hmm. and everything that I do outside becomes mirrored on the inside and everything that I do inside becomes mirrored in how I do things on the outside. Right. That, that was just an observation that I made, but it sounds like that's similar to what you're saying, that this is this spectrum of density in which, oh, oh, oh right, like water and, and vapor and, and ice. 
Yeah, and a place where it's one and the same. So we might say uh -huh. that in playing the heart, that that moment where you hear the music internally and it's coming out in the strings, there's a place where both the outer and the inner are one and the same. And that's when people make beautiful music. It's when also we're living from the truth of our heart and soul, when somehow what we're doing day in and day out with our attitudes and our thoughts and our habits and the feelings that are just automatically occurring in our body are one and the same. Okay, so when we're not, uh, so, so that's fluency. I mean, fluency. yes. Right, okay. Um, all right, and then and, and I noticed that with my with students that many of them the the problem is that they're constantly stuttering, and I observe this in myself as well. In fact, I was just doing it when we're trying to be just a little bit ahead of ourselves. We can get into a constant state of being disjunct, and yet we can have fluency at any level of technical ability. For example, um, I was spent a lot of time in Germany. I was, hadn't, wasn't a good German speaker, but I became fluent with all my foibles and all the wrong ways I said things. I became to the point that I could actually think and speak and reach out to someone physically. So it became fluent. Yes, and it was like it all came together. It was, there was a synergy where it was all happening simultaneously in a helpful way. Right, and then each thing is amplifying or, or enriching the others. Aha! Great, yes. carry on! <laughs> and there's a circuit that informs one another. You know, there's a, the inner informs the outer, the outer informs the inner. Right. And it's a basic principle of alchemy, which Jung, as well as others, considered to be a metaphor for the individuation process, as within, so without. That... Interesting. Yeah. And so what part of what you're teaching with um, the strings of passion, as well as all of your other work, is if you really feel it internally and you find the structure, you find, um, you, you know, it's like following the riverbed, we might say, huh. then something flows out that's beautiful and it, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't right. have to be um, impressive, but it but it thus then touches you and touches other people because there is a power of it that comes from the alignment of inner and outer, of heart and ego. Okay, uh, so many things are racing through my mm -hmm. mind. The idea of being true, of a, a line or something being plumb or true, and mm -hmm. how when that is the case, you are you can actually move as a full being rather than compensating if you're off balance you're constantly compensating um oh gosh there was so much else that came that came in but um but keep going it's just like my brain is is flashing all over the place right <laughs> well you know part of what you do with the structure for music and i think you do this um, a great example is when you talk about the 12 bar blues yep yeah. You know, that there's this basic structure that if you understand the 12 bar blues and the progression, then there's a lot of things that can happen different within the structure. And so part of the work of individuation is knowing our own internal structure, how we work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are different systems that try to get at this with labels. For instance, astrology and the signs of the zodiac is an attempt to get at structures. Mm -hmm. The um, Enneagram, the Myers-Briggs typology. What I would say is those though are still basic um, structures that even within that, there's, there are a zillion variations of each. So part of our work for, in terms of our own life and living from our heart and soul is to know what our structure is and then flesh it out in the way that our own soul, their own psyche leads. Wow. So it's making me think that, that e each of us get like a, a little playbook that we can't read, you know? <laughs> and maybe we never read it, but, but there's a playbook of us. And, and if we can open it up the understanding of it, yes. we can play that playbook of who we are. And the, and what, 
Um, and the more, and this is why I call it creative resonance. It seems like the more we are connected in what we do and who we are, um, the greater our resonance. Yes, yes. Because it's like tapping into the source. You know, when we really are creating, for instance, when you play the 12 bar blues or you improv, you're creating out of that vast energy pool that's Debor. Right. You know, and that has its own unique imprint and sound, just like your fingerprints unique. And, you know, I was here, someone was telling me recently that everybody's voice also is unique if it's measured on whatever that instrument is that can measure voice. <laughs> the voice gram The voice gram <laughs> You know, and so it's like there's a uniqueness. And so part of what you're talking about with structure is if you understand your own uniqueness internally, then you're going to be creating from yourself. And there's a whole different confidence and um, level of fluency that's going to happen. So I want to go back, like there's five things here that I, um, I want to talk about the 12 bar blues and what happens once you get that amazingly simple form. And I'm also really love this idea about having a voice because as a, mm -hmm. as a kid, I, um, I don't know where I got in my head that if you, um, you could get, if you had an out of body experience, um, you might get lost because I knew the world was happening, was moving very fast. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you know, if you're, mind got out of your body or your body got out of your mind, everything else might move away. And there you would be like lost without your body. And how would you find it? You can't find it because you don't have eyes. You don't have ears. You don't have the senses. You can't find yourself again. And um, realize that there's, it is your voice. Then this is a song from a show that I wrote called yeah. what the hell are you doing in the waiting room for heaven, which is basically you have a voice that's yours alone. And this is how your soul can find you. That it that that voice that that soul print is there, and you will be you will know when you lock back in with it. And I'm assuming that that is what our journey is. We are lost when we come here. We are trying to lock with that soul, and often we don't recognize it. And I'm assuming that's part of what therapy is about. Yes, Jungian analysis is very much about learning to discern among the many voices that live in us. What is the voice of the true self? And what are the voices of the learned adaptive self? You know, what are the voices that we've internalized vis-a-vis -vis experiences with the outside world and other people? And, you know, because so often we limit ourselves because we have these, we listen to these voices internally that really aren't our soul, but they got internalized when we were so young. We have no cognitive memory of it. So we just think that's who we are. Oh, I can't do that. I've mm -hmm. never been able to do that. You know, I can't play the harp. I've never been, you know, those kinds of negative things when the soul may say, no, that's in you. And the energy's there and can be tapped into it. It can pull you forward. We have to be willing, though, to let the energy pull us forward. Wow. And that means we need to be able to know when we're experiencing it. Right. And to, to, to be willing and courageous enough to follow our voice, the voice of the self, even when other people are naysayers. I mean, you've talked about this when you started singing, when your um, manager came to you and said, so-and-so said you would ruin your career if you quit. <laughs> right. And you said, I'm going to sing. That's right, right, because this is me and bad or good. Yeah. This, is, this is who I am and this is what I have to bring. Yes, yeah, and you followed that. So that's an example of something in you was pushing you forward pulling you forward and you just mm. you people say to me how am I going to know it's the voice of the self true self I'm like you know I mean it feels different doesn't it uh, well I don't know you know that's really funny I mean I needed a, I needed to see somebody else go through that I needed to th there's an actual there's a story that there there were two two harpists who I was following and who played harp beautifully and all uh, and sang in a way I I was judging as well, their, play, their singing isn't as great as their harp playing, so why are they doing it? You know, this was my thinking. If it's not perfect, why would you do it? And, um, and so 
I watched their career and this, they put out an album and I was like, gee, why? Are, I, I talked to them. I said, why, why are you singing? You're playing, your heart playing is so great. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of them said, because that's what we do. And I was like, well, I'm never going to let anybody hear me do that. <laughs> you know, the next year they put out another album, their singing is better. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Third year, they put out an album, and their singing and their playing is both great. And I'm thinking, oh, but mine isn't, mm -hmm. because I am not doing what I do. And when I do what, when we do what we do, it's not doesn't always. It's not always like, oh, I just tapped into it. That is amazing. Sometimes it comes out incredibly awkwardly. And I talk about this a lot. About you know, anything that's born, it gets born slimy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I always think I always think about looking at a kitten and being like, you know, seeing a slimy little kitten coming out and saying, Well, you're not a you're a terrible kitten. Kittens are fluffy and nice. You're terrible. And I think we do that to ourselves. Yes. That things comes out. Um, so all right, so you're saying there's a voice print and there's us and we may not know who you know we don't come we come with that voice, but then there's all the other voices that we will internalize. And so it becomes much more difficult to hear our voice. Yes. And I know that one of the first exercises I have student, harp students do in Strings of Passion is I, have, I make a soundscape of just music and have them play single notes in a, and listen to them. Mm -hmm. But within a harmony, so it sounds beautiful. And all right, so, and that helps them to be able to actually play and listen and love. Mm -hmm. Play and listen and love, not play and listen and criticize. Right. So how do, you, how do you have your people do that as just human beings without instruments? You know, one of the things I think we all have to cultivate is compassionate presence with ourselves. I think we talked a little bit about this last time or one of the times and mm -hmm. you know, Part of, I think, how we begin to develop that for ourselves is by experiencing it with someone else. So part of what happens in the analytic relationship between the analyst and the analysand is that the analyst comes with a presence that is, I, I would say, compassionate, a compassionate witnessing, a non-judgmental, but a, let's just be with what is and let's be curious about it. Let's see what that's telling us. Let's see what bit of your soul is in that? Because that's the other thing that I love about Jung's theory and belief, and I find this to be true, that everything inside of us, even that adaptive voice that might turn on us and criticize us, is ultimately some attempt to help us. It's just sometimes what helps us survive at two, three, four, and six with the adults around us who don't know any better but to be critical and shut us down in an attempt to get us to be good right. um it served us at that point it's just it may not be serving us at 30 40 50 or 60 and we have to begin to say you know that isn't serving me but yes it helped me at one time and so it's almost like for the negative in us to go away we also have to be able to have a compassionate presence with it and feel gratitude for how it did serve us at some time. Then it can let go. It's like, you know, we don't need that anymore. So this is really interesting. Um, uh, of course, yeah. that's why we're doing it. <laughs> um, um, so I'm hearing a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, well, I heard you say we resonate with others, which is beautiful. I heard you say we want to help and or all these things want to help and i also heard you say that the the therapist provides this compa compassion and that and i almost hear that compassion is like like i make these soundscapes for students where there's a beautiful sound that all the notes of the harp fit into mm -hmm. so that there is that sense of beauty and so it sounds like compassion is like that it's like this experience scape in which anything that you do you can hear the beauty of it yes and and the word containment keeps coming to mind and i think again this fits with structure that the internal structure also gives containment your soundscape gives containment 
the compassionate presence of the analyst or in a, a friend or between us creates containment that then allows whatever's bubbling up to be seen for what it is. Wow. I also, you're, as you say containment, I think of the times that I've been inside of containers mm -hmm. and the resonance that I literally hear inside mm -hmm. that container. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that you said is uh, all these voices want to help. Now, years ago, you know, when I started thinking about humans and animals and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and I was like, what? you know, what are our instincts? You know, what are our instincts? And, and I, I thought that the one instinct I observed people have is to copy things. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't copy what somebody does back to us, we probably wouldn't learn language because we wouldn't, there wouldn't be any, re a cat doesn't say back to me what I say to it, doesn't care. But, but we do, children will say back or mm -hmm. say the sounds back. Um, so do we have an instinct to help I mean because you said these voices all want to help why what makes them want to help what I, I think how I would say it um, is that there is a movement towards life so when we, ah. we want to help it's really let's take helping out because that's so overlaid with a lot of different meanings but there is this impulse toward life and, and, and self-preservation. Uh, self and psychically, the self-preservation becomes for some sense of self with worth and value. So of course, we know there's the self-preservation instinct from the animal nature, and we also have that. But that psychically, we're talking about the, the self-preservation of a sense of self, that I am a person of value and worth. So the psychological defenses that come in or the neuroses that come in are attempts to help one's sense of self as valuable and worthy stay intact. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so it really, it, the, the helping is towards staying alive. <laughs> and, and again, the first staying alive is, of course, physical, but psychically, and what we're talking about is staying alive as a self, as a center of consciousness where one says, this is who I am. For the musician, when they create, and as you've created composition and or an orchestra and gone out and played it, mm -hmm. you have to have a strong enough sense of self as a musician and your own presence as a musician to withstand whatever criticism or judgment may come your way. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, yeah. yeah, and that, I mean, that leads to other strings like leadership and followership. Mm -hmm because I realize that whenever I am creating something, I'm really following uh, something inside of me rather than creating it. I'm, I'm, I'm listening at the best. I am listening as I'm doing it. Yes. So it, it sounds like, and, and the, you also made me think of, uh, I think there's a, a life energy in the Jewish tradition or Hebrew or whatever, uh, Yasat, Yasatov, I don't know what the name is, but there's the Yasahara, which is the death energy. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the Yasatov, I, th I think I've got it right, I don't know. But you just made me think about that, like when I asked, why do we want to help? And then you said there's an energy, or there is, there is that, that movement towards life. Yes. So that seems to be the organizing principle. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I know that um, for me, when I first observed or noticed observation, uh, observing structure was when my stepfather, um, a new stepfather when I was seven, sat me down at the kitchen table, gave me a glass of warm water, a cup of sugar, a spoon, a string, and a pencil. And he told me to take the sugar and stir it up into the water and then and make it absolutely saturated until that water was saturated and then he um, tied the string to the pencil put the pencil on top put the string down into the water and then we went to bed and when we came out in the morning the string was covered with these sugar crystals which was magical mm -hmm. and I said why wow why and he said well sugar crystals are always going to happen that's what they're going to do when the string is there, 
that provides an internal structure. I don't think he said it like this right. I mean, years later, but that provides the thing around which they're going to crystallize. Yes. And so I got it in my head. There's the string and the sugar water all over, all over. It's all over. I can look for it. And that will be the organizing principle or the internal thing that is bringing everything around it. Yes. Now, and it sounds like that is the life energy or the life, the. Yeah. Jung, Jung would say that every psyche has a gradient. You were talking about the playbook. It made me think he says, every psyche has a gradient that the libido or the life force will follow. And that when we follow that libido, that flow of energy naturally, that's when we're the healthiest. <coughs> what you're referencing from the Jewish tradition I, I think about is that there are three forces that work us every day, the force of creation, the force of equilibrium, and the force of destruction. We see it in metabolism. There's anabolism and catabolism. You know, we take in food, we tear it down, you know, or you, let's use muscles. Muscles, we tear muscle down, then muscle builds back up, you know. And so there are these three energies. And part of what um, we do when we live a creative life and when we individuate, which means I do believe living a creative life, whether you're a musician or not, then what we're looking at is how do we follow this flow of energy in service of the soul, in service of life, so that we begin to learn how to connect to our destructive energies to stop those patterns that block us, that hurt us. We connect to this destructive energy to keep our own um, out of balance impulses in check. But using the destructive energy consciously in service of life is different than how it often gets used in a way that destroys, that destroys oh, self. Well, so Oh, so it might destroy the wrong, the things that we want. It might exactly. accidentally, I see. In fact, my favorite definition of evil mm. is that evil is misapplied force. Uh -huh. That it's evil to build up something that needs to be destroyed. Uh -huh. And it's evil to destroy something that needs to be built up. Interesting. So that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, we won't put <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> let's put it on the docket for... Um, <laughs> but so I was... As we, yeah, every force has a rightful place. And part of our work as human beings, I believe, is to learn how to consciously recognize these energies and then work with them in service of life versus against life, against ourselves or against other people. So how do we, I'm writing all these things down here. And one of the, um, so one of the things I, I, I wanted to ask is, is destructive same as deconstructive? I do not think it's the same. Although okay. I think there's a connection in that and deconstruction, you're taking things apart. Right. And deconstruction, you're taking things apart consciously uh -huh. with the intention of connecting to the essence. Okay, right, yeah. Destruction can be random. It's, it can be pointless. It can be... De so we might say de deconstruction is a form of destruction, but I don't think they're one and the same. I think okay. there's a lot of destruction that does not qualify oh. as deconstruction in the sense okay. that you're using it in the strings of power. Okay, okay. So we'll, worry, we'll think about that later when we get to that one. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and one of the questions that came to me as you were talking is, was it just a big question? Okay. Uh, I wish I could put it right back to the moment at which it came to me, which is, okay, how do you live a creative life? Because you were talking about a creative life is one in which we are both discovering mm -hmm. and connecting to and resonating mm -hmm. this. Well, I think it's the equivalent of our skeleton or the sugar, the string of the sugar water, but in a psychic way. Yes. And am I, yes, you're on track. And I, I, I'm going to take it back that the first thing, how do you know, is you have to pay attention to the impulses that originate from with your own body mind and begin to follow those impulses to see where are they rooted. 
Is this impulse rooted in my larger self, my soul, or is this impulse rooted in a learned adaptive pattern that's no longer serving me? And ooh. do I need to stop or do I, I know, just, to... ooh, tell me more. And, and, and then of course I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> Well, it really has to do with being able to be in relationship with whatever goes on inside of us. And to be in relationship, we have to be able to acknowledge, to recognize, to validate, to accept, and to be able to, to not to be non-judgmental and to be able to dialogue with it, to hear what it has to say. So relationship really is the key. You know, and when we can be in relationship to whatever goes on inside of us, then something can shift organically. I, I want to ask so much about that. And as you're talking, I, I was getting this image of that. There's a children's book called Are You My Mother? Where some little animal is going around to all the other animals and saying, are you my mother? Are you my mother? Because the, the animal can't recognize herself or himself and, and others. And I was thinking, wow, so... I was imagining going around to every part of me. Are you me? Am, am, are you me? Are, are you me? And how do I recognize me? In well, and I would say psychically, there's a bit of you in all those parts. But that bit of you or the seed of your soul or larger self may have gotten flushed out in a very distorted way. But the key is how is is going in to connect with the seed because there's a part of us in all of those things even the most destructive things that we hate about ourselves. The key to the behavior shifting is connecting with the seed of the self that's in the behavior. So for instance, an, an easy one is people who binge eat. You mm -hmm. know, that binge eating very often is connected to a need for comfort and holding, kind of mothering. Mm -hmm. And so when one can connect with that deep, deep internal longing for the mothering, for the nurturing and the holding, then one can begin to give that to oneself and the binging will begin to stop. Oh, because you're, you're grabbing for the thing that it, it, it's not going to solve the problem. Exactly. It's a substitute. Mm, it's a yeah. substitute that's, that's going to, it's like trying to hold water in your hands and it's falling through. Well, it doesn't work because yeah. the, the, I love the expression. You can never, you can never get enough of what you really don't need. Right. Right, you're right, that's right. Of what you really don't right. need. Yeah. yeah. So, so what you're needing is a sense of emotional holding and comfort. Right. No matter how much food you eat, you're not going to get that. You may get a temporary gratification. Right. You're not going to get a satisfaction of the need. And it's not easy. It, I, it, if it was easy, there would not be hundreds of 12-step programs that's or right. therapists around the world. Okay. That's right. Uh, oh gosh. Okay. So, um, you, you were talking about relational, um, you, you're going to discover this in relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming this is in part because if you can't hear yourself or see yourself in others, you, you can't know what's happening. If, if, okay. like, if you're, yeah. And, um, <laughs> like if you can't, if you, if you can't see what you're writing, you can't get clearer at your writing. Yeah, there, it, there has to be this sense of, okay, here I am is the larger me, and here's this part of me, you know? So here I am, and here's this part of me, let's just say that's feeling like, oh, why bother writing? Why bother composing? It won't be any good. But there's this uh -huh. other part of me that's wanting to write and compose. And right. so, you know, uh -huh. then you can begin to have a dialogue. But if you're just consumed by you know, well, I don't, I, I don't need to write or compose. It won't be any good. There isn't any capacity to get separate from it. You know, there, there isn't any right. capacity to relate when you're consumed in it. And that's very funny to me because um, I, I always, you know, doing something well and doing something are a completely different thing. <laughs> and, and, and I know that I'm always saying that students are like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I like, could you do it badly? And they're like, well, yeah. Uh -huh. And then be like, well, great then you're doing it. Right. right. And yet there's so much uh, avoidance of that. So I, I feel, I love this. I, I just, I'm writing so many notes and I'm trying, and I want to bring it back to structure. Okay. Because I think that we both agree that understanding structure or feeling that structure or seeing that structure 
gives support to expression. Absolutely. And it gives a sense of containment out of which one can then express. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it gives us containment. And when you say containment, I immediately think resonance and I'm not sure why, but it just, but I know that it gives. So, so things don't just go all over the place, but you can actually see and hear what you're doing. Yeah. So there's an internal structure that gives you support and flexibility. Um, and there is a container which gives you resonance and so that you don't get just completely, I mean, if we weren't contained. Right. And, and what I'm going to say in terms of Jungian analysis and the individuation process, and individuation was Jung's word for really living the truth of your soul. I'm, I'm simplifying it a little uh -huh. bit. Then the container or the structure becomes the sense of self where the ego, the little self, has a sense of connection consciously to the largesse of one's soul. Okay, say that again. So that when that that the structure is when we consciously have a connection to the larger self that we are. So for instance, in this moment, you and I are both coming together and we have a sense of who we are and what we do, but we both also have a trust that we're connected to something far more than what I'm aware I am in this moment, that there's a whole lot more to me than I might can think in this one moment. You have that or you could never improvise. So we can come together and have a spontaneous dialogue because we have enough little self ego that is connected to this larger vat of energy that is first our soul and psyche, which then is connected onto the larger, where we trust there's the flow. Right. So I'm not worried that I'm going to get lost. Right. You're worried really Even... we're going to get lost. Yeah. Uh -huh. So and this is where... The, I'm sorry. Part of the structure, then you're helping people identify in, um, in the strings of passion. And again, when you teach the 12 bar blues is to have this sense of, okay, here you are. And there's this thing over here that's bigger than you that right. taps you in to the something more. Well, that's what I was just thinking, just as you, I was thinking of the 12 bar blues and I'm not going to sing it now, but the 12 bar blues is a very, very simple structure. It, it can be learned very simply. And when you get that structure and you feel it, you begin to understand that it is happening whether you're playing the notes or not. Yes. And you start really understanding that the notes are not the music. There could be absolute silence throughout, throughout, and the 12 bar blues can still be happening. Yes. Yes. So I'm thinking that that, that is the power of structure in holding us mm -hmm. so that we can have utter freedom the utter freedom in music to not play a note. And so I'm sensing, like I can feel what the 12 bar blues feels like. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you as a union analyst and someone who's living that can probably feel a similar simple structure that is constantly in play, yes. whether, we're, whether we're playing the notes or not. Exactly. Yes. One begins to have this sense of inner structure that is the self that allows one to move through the world with poise and grace and enough trust and to have the courage to have one's own voice. Wow. So it's almost as though that is in play. That is in play at all times. That is the structure. And the more that we can feel it, then whatever we do will be within its, it will be in relationship to it. It will be Absolutely. adding harmony to it. Will be. Absolutely. And it's, and, and is with the 12 bar blues, it's there whether we're feeling it or we're conscious of it or not. But when we feel it and we're conscious of it, it's a whole different relationship. And we then in terms of our sense of self in the moment have a feeling of a foundation of support of resources of energy and and an ability to play with others and to make har harmony and to actually be in relation yeah yeah 
Yeah. Wow. So and I'm excited about this because yeah. <laughs> I know this is, well, we're coming to the end of this session. Yeah. I'm excited because now I want to look for that in mm -hmm. not just in blues, but so what would be one simple thing I could do this week to feel that for myself in my journey of finding me? You know, I think the stream of consciousness writing, which again, you have people do in strings of passion, right. just, you know, when you find yourself feeling confused or in conflict about something, sit down and journal and see, feel into what's the stronger voice. Oh, or is the self leading you? Yeah. Right. And what are all, what are all the other, other voices that are coming in? So for me, I might also make it as a play because I love a play yes. and let the other voices have their say yes. and see what they sound like, hear what they sound like without actually judging them. Yes. yes. And what, and what I would say for other people, well, there's so, I feel like we could talk about this for five weeks. Um, the idea of structure yes. and how it gives us relationship to ourselves and to things. So I would say to people, start looking for the patterns, the, the things that you do over and over again, and how they give you the opportunity to actually connect to hum other human beings. Mm -hmm. And I want to look for that in myself too. Yeah. And how can I increase that resonance? Yes. Either by maybe for me, very simply looking in people's eyes or, or touching people, mm -hmm. that will increase the resonance of what I'm doing and yes. add that to it. Yes. Wow. Is there any last thing that you want to say? I, I, just, I just feel this is so rich. I want to just look at all my notes. Yeah, no, I think we've said a lot, but I'll look forward to next week. That's what me I'll say. Me too. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And I will look forward to seeing you again next week. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.